Um, so yeah, so on socialist news and views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just tell listeners about yourself? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafi Ruchitsky, uh Konstantin Ruchitsky, as I used to go by. Um, I was born in the USSR in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And I, um, I spent most of my time in, uh, the longest I've lived anywhere, though, has been in Minneapolis. Um, I lived in Minneapolis where I went to school uh, for over a decade. Um, and so I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, with kind of uh, the various kind of socialist politics around the city. Um, and, uh, and also, um, and I study, uh, I myself study refugees and migration, in, mostly in Eastern Europe. And in Ukraine, especially, uh, and so I, um, you know, I'm also familiar with, with uh, various current affairs, global affairs, and um, and of research on, um, on 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 migration and refugees um, in in different parts of the world, but especially in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so so I'm I'm here to you know I was invited here to kind of talk to you about Russia and Ukraine more generally. So I'm just going to turn it over to Nick and ask you, I mean, what do you want to, um, what do you want us to focus on? There's just, there's so much to talk about. Well, I think, you know, I mean, to start, I, I just wanted to at least briefly start where our conversation most recently started in November of 2023. Um, and I was actually just watching another little video on this this morning. Uh, Sasha, uh, Skochalenko was sentenced to seven years in prison in Russia for posting stickers critical of uh, Putin's war uh, in Ukraine in a grocery store, little, uh, you know, grocery price stickers. Um, I mean, I think that's, I mean, it just highlights, that's an outrageous sentence, first of all, obviously, for for posting stickers. I mean, something that, you know, activists all across the city do all the time, uh, seven years in prison. And when I posted that, you said uh, on the post, quote, she's an awesomely positive and courageous person, honored to run into her in Petersburg at an art event once. I hear she has a serious medical medical condition and may not survive Russian prison, but having met her just once, I know she has the spirit to survive it. That's why they may be targeting her to try to break her, end quote. And I saw, you know, I just saw in this video for today, you know, she's in the prison cell, she's smiling and waving. And I think, you know, I think you're right in that, um, that she's a very spirited person and a person who's really courageous and believes uh, very strongly in what she's doing. And again, that's why they're uh, making a, a target out of her. I just, I just wanted to start out. I wonder if you could speak just a little bit more about her, about that encounter, um, what that event is, because she sounds like an amazing person and a very brave individual to uh, to stand up against the war from inside of Russia. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that she's far from alone. I mean, even when I, you know, spent my uh, year change in Petersburg in 2014 and 2015, where I taught at a university there and had the pleasure of very briefly meeting her. Um, you know, their uh, repressions were ongoing. I mean, in the U.S., we have state repression, you know, people being put in jail. You know, had, in Minneapolis 10 years ago, we had some activists who were targeted by the, F by the FBI for their international solidarity activism. This is kind of in the same kind of genre, right, of repression where there is, um, you know, uh, there's, there's an, an imperialist war that is, uh, that is ongoing and the government, um, uh, you know, representing that imperialist war, right, is trying to repressed dissent right. um, in the country. So, um, you know, and I, and, and in my, you know, my experience, I just met her briefly. Um, you know, I think it was, if I can remember it correctly, it's been a long time now. I think it was an, uh, an, an event dedicated to migrant rights in Russia um, struggles I've been involved with in the US and said even Ukraine. Um, so I think she read a poem and helped them see the event. I spoke with her for just a few minutes afterwards. But so most of our good call is that she had kind of a glow and curiosity about her positivity. Um, that you talk about. And, and I also understand from her supporters, I'm not personally in touch with directly, but, you know, I know people who, who, who have, who know her well, um, and, and she's a well-liked figure across the new left in Russia. Um, and perhaps that's why she wasn't being arrested. Um, she's being targeted. Um, she is, you know, she's kind of a, she's a very honest person from what I understand. And so she, they were, you know, if, I think often when you have state repression happening, in the U.S., I think we can learn about actually, right? We could see what governments do, and I think there's patterns to it, right? right. Um, you know, they often target people who are, um, you know, often the most upstanding and upstanding uh, and honest people in in movements, and try to and try to, um, you know, try to target movements in that way. So, um, 
And I understand from her supporters, she was a very widely liked figure, right? So she was arrested in this very simple act of resistance. I, 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 I hear that, you know, she, she used to go around grocery stores in her everyday life and she goes shopping and puts stickers on. You know, I think Palace, Palestinian solidarity activists in, 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 in U.S. around the world do that now with Israeli products. They'll go around and put a sticker on, right. on made in Israel, right? This is a very similar kind of thing she was doing in Russia, but actually informing people about not the product, but the war. Um, mm -hmm. and, because there's very few places that Russians can look that they're not thrown with kind of massive loads of propaganda that glorify the war um, and, and tell the truth about, you know, the horrors of the war and the, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that have been killed and millions right. displaced, right? So there's very little places that Russians can look. So she was trying to shine a light on that, right, from within the belly of the beast there. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, she's also an out lesbian. She's a health issue. She's a, pub, you know, she's a public figure. So she, there's reason, there, it, it makes sense why they would target her in terms of a campaign in Russia um, against kind of, uh, it, it, that would be benefit to the state, beneficial to the state. But she's surviving in prison, you know, and you probably looked on her Facebook pages where a lot of her supporters gather from around the world that are outside of that support committee. Um, and she seems, you know, she seems to be just fine, fortunately. That's cool. Um, so, but again, I want to stress that she's far from alone and the massive right. state repression that has uh, been widely uh, exacerbated since um, uh, since since the war began. And uh, um, so, for, uh, for example, um, pronounced Russian socialist uh, and uh, uh, politician, a uh, new left a new left politician, Boris Kagalitsky, who was an, also an academic for a long time in the school of uh, uh, in the higher school of economics, the university that's now kind of been taken by the Russian state and a lot of the dissidents ex kind of expelled from there. He has been, after we, you know, he has been sentenced to, um, I don't remember, I think it's up to seven years in prison by a Russian military court. He was first acquitted. Um, and he, he simply, again, posted some remark online, right? Uh, I was against the war. So he, in the nineties, he was kind of a, a, a Polit more of a political figure. He's a, a intellectual. He's in a school of um, uh, globalization, he's, uh, globalization, social movements, and in the higher school of economics in Moscow. Um, so he was recently charged, um, and he's he's going to be going away to prison. And it's uh, so. And in, in, sure. then in Russia, this happens all. This 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 has been happening for a long time, but it has been widely exacerbated since the war. Um, so even more recently, there's this guy, uh, Sierra Kravlo. Uh, Kralov, who was who's being accused of it, um, if I can represent this, uh, uh, in, in basically what's in Russia called the distribution of um, of of uh, falsified information about uh, the, the 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 Russian armed forces, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so and so there's, there's these various new laws that have been passed in Russia that have been kind of pre used as pretext to um, detain and charge and put away for many years a lot of um, people who you know, shine a light in dark places um, in Russia. And um, so I encourage you guys to, uh, to, but I encourage you guys to also consider, to also not just follow, you know, repressions in Russia, um, but also, um, but also remember that in Ukraine, you know, most people who are at the brunt of this war, right, those are the voices we should be really listening to, right? There's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, people who have, who have perished, who uh, have taken arms to defend um, to defend to defend Ukraine to defend Ukraine, well, mostly a lot of them on the Ukrainian left that have perished mm. in the war. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I can I can talk a lot about those folks as well, um, including yeah, one I... of the website that I, we mentioned before we started the recording that I want to recommend to many of your readers later. The Commons. Um, there was an edit. One of the main editors of that website um, was uh, was killed and was uh, has has recently died, and and a few people who have been um, uh, international solidarity activists who have, you know, fought in Rojava, um, and, and, and have also have been, have also have fought in, um, with, with, with leftists in U for Ukraine, um, against Russian occupation imperialism. So, um, I want to make sure that shine a light on those voices first and mm. foremost, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of repression in Russia and actually most of the, most of those folks have left, a lot of those folks have left, mm. a lot of the people I knew in Russia have left. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, whether they go to, uh, whether they've left to former Soviet republics or went to Europe or the U S a lot of those folks have left. Um, and you know, it's, 
you know, I myself left as a kid, I had no volition, right? But it's also showing, right, that a lot of the, unlike Karolitsky and, you know, and uh, Skachilenko, you know, a lot of, most of the kind of Russian and uh, left and intelligentsia and professional class um, in general, right, are leaving Russia, mm. right? So that will, that will often dampen the possibilities for, um, for resistance from within Russia. So I don't want to, well, we, what we, I also want to caution and kind of glorifying some of these individuals that are, are courageous, right? That we also consider that there is a lot of people that have left. The scope right. of oppression is so wide and so broad that a lot of people have left Russia. Um, I don't know when, if they, they will be coming back. Yeah. And you, I mean, yeah, this kind of, we're getting into this. I was going to, you know, say you said it's the, the beginning of the war that, uh, the beginning of the Russian invasion that you, still had friends and family in Ukraine. Obviously a lot of people have left Ukraine as well uh, at different times. Some of them come back, some haven't. Right. Um, and so do you still have friend, a uh, number of friends and family in Ukraine currently? Um, and you know, what are they telling you about the situation there? What are they telling you about the ongoing uh, fighting happening in Ukraine? Um, I'm a little bit curious too. I don't know if you've heard anything, if any of these people that have left Russia this is just kind of coming to me now, but any of these people that have left Russia and maybe are in Europe or I don't know where they are, is there any, you know, discussion going on between people that have left Ukraine and people that have left Russia about what do we do? <laughs> Especially people on the, on the left, are they, you know, right. are they meeting up like physically at all anywhere in Europe and, and talking about uh, these issues? I wonder if you've heard anything on that, but first, what are you hearing from friends and family in Ukraine? Yeah, those are different questions, but um, I, to the, to the first, you know, I've, I've not, first of all, I have not been back since the start of the war. Um, but I, you know, in the years preceding the war, um, in decade, I would say preceding the war, I, I'd, I'd been back often. Um, and I started my graduate studies in, and in, in, so I've, so I've studied, um, I often look to study people that had left Ukraine since my family had left. So Ukraine is often a transit and new immigration country for, and also a reception country for refu for refugees from all over the world, not just former Soviet countries, unlike Russia. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of looked about, looked at the various politics that uh, result from um, EU and Russian foreign policy towards the Ukraine and how that impacts refugees. So that's kind of like why I've been back to Ukraine, but I have most of my fam personal family have left. So I can tell you a little bit about, you know, from like uh, a research perspective, like what I, about the, about what's going on in Ukraine, about who people are coming and going. But personally, my personal, my family had left in the 1990s, most of them. I have some extended family left in Ukraine, um, but I myself am from the frontline city of Kharkiv, mm -hmm. which is 40 miles south of the Russian border in kind of North Central Eastern Ukraine. And that has been, you know, remember it was, it was nearly surrounded by Russian troops in the early, early days of the war, kind of Kiev was. Right. And, um, and, and, but has been con under continued and almost and da oh, nearly daily bombardment. Um, you know, uh, the city stands, it's not, you know, Marinka or it's not Avdivka now, right? It's not occupied, but it's, it's, um, it is a city that is courageously resisting invasion. So I've, most of the people I know are from, you know, are from all, you know, are all over Ukraine. But I know people in in in, in Kiev and also in, in Kharkiv. Um, but they are. Uh, it is interesting that a lot of the people who I know personally who had left in the early days of the war have come back, hmm. right? Whereas people I know from and this is just like a personal trivial sure. observation, not a scholarly observation. Whereas people I know from Russia that have left have, have stayed away, um, and and you know, and that, and I think that's actually attributable to the initial Ukrainian, I mean, unlike, very unlikely, I think, resistance to the initial invasion. This is before, you know, any, any, any international uh, support weapon, weapon, weapons and so, uh, were, were coming to Ukraine. Ukrainians basically with their bare hands fought off a massive Russian invasion that resulted in total destruction and, and uh, probably permanent occupation of the country. And the, there were very fine margins there at the, at the end. But I think the very fact that people have come back um, is because of that initial, um, you know, successful resistance, right, to the wholesale um, invasion occupation when every city was being bombed and there was a massive invasion of the whole country that was underway, right, and the Russian troops were driven back. Most people in that aftermath who had left, there was over 10 million people had left their homes, 
some of them from all over the country, but most from the from now occupied parts of, of Eastern Ukraine, um, had left. Many of them, many of them had gone to Poland, right, and other parts and their countries in Europe. Um, and almost and more than half, but more than half had stayed in, had moved on to Western Ukraine, kind of more remote parts. Many of them have all uh, many of those folks have returned. Um, of the people, especially that were internally displaced, who were not in under-occupied territories, those folks are still, you know, living elsewhere, mostly mostly around cities now and major cities in Ukraine, like Kiev. But the folks who are in in in, in those those some people in Poland have like have have been able to stay. Many of them have been forced to return because of um, the initial kind of welcoming rolled out the, you know, the carpet kind of policies that Poland and, and other European countries first open to Ukrainians, right? And right. Some, uh, some people were pointing that was, that was somewhat contradictory to the ways that um, Europe has treated other migrants, right? Right, I was gonna but, mention but, that, yeah. Yeah, so, but like all of that has been undone. It's done, <laughs> yeah. It was, it, was, it was undone. It was a very temporary policy. So you, Poles, Poles used to get like, um, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a subsidy for hosting ref Ukrainian mm. refugees, housing subsidy. That was that was removed within months. Um, you know, the, the the various social supports that were available for Ukrainians were removed within months. Uh, people have stayed because it's the next country next door. I want to remind people, right? <laughs> like uh, like Palestinians in Lebanon or Syria, like that's just the most proximate place you can go and culturally most proximate, right? Um, and so you know. There are social supports that were organized, but the, in, in 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 Europe, unfortunately, in Poland, especially the right wing government there, um, a lot of those support, social supports were rolled back pretty quickly. I think it's ironic that a lot of those folks who were kind of calling for why are Ukrainians getting special treatment, they weren't getting special treatment. There was a budget mass displacement scenario. There's right. almost seven million people who were displaced internationally at first. Um, and that were you know there were some initial kind of disaster level kind of initial supports that were rolled out. A lot of those were kind of rolled back and they were rolled back um, thanks to kind of this um, unholy alliance between the left and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tanky left and the, and the right wing government in Poland um, to, to, uh, to kind of roll those back. Um, fortunately, most of those people who have since returned are, are not in uh, are not from the occupied territories. Those that have left and are tend to be from the occupied territories and have nothing nowhere to go to have gone. Some, I would, I think, you know, the vast majority have gone to your to EU countries, um, and and a few in the, the United States has allowed uh, a new. There's a refuge. There's a new kind of um, program for Ukrainians that was developed. U for you. U the number four U. If you guys want to okay. look at. Um, and it was it was a temporary program, and it's it's due to run out soon. It's only it's only allowing a hundred thousand people to enter. Mm -hmm. it was earmarked by Biden. They didn't cap that, but they haven't really let in many more either. Um, so it's not like the U.S. has also been very welcoming to the Ukrainians who are, you know, in part, uh, you know, a product of uh, uh, whose displacement, much like Vietnamese folks, you know, are a product of you know, collaboration of various events that have happened in other countries that are attributable to U.S. U.S. policy, right? So right. U.S. has not been very welcoming to Ukrainians is what I want to highlight for you guys, right? If you were talking about people leaving, um, and that's one of the things I want to stress, right, is that we often hear like, oh, you know, in today's world with so many international conflicts that aren't going, the world seems to be exploding, and but we right. don't want we don't want to pit people against one another and be be very you know, carefully study what is happening on the ground before we make judgments and for and for whatever political points you want to score. Right. Because Ukrainians have been not on, not on the receiving end. Ukrainians are not considered white in Russia mm. in the broader form of Soviet states. They are considered an other. It's not in a racial way, in a global kind of in the global kind of decolonial politics that we know of. But in the region, they're not. Ukrainians are not seen as kind of. Um, an ethnically or not seen in a kind of an ethnically um, uh, dominant group to whom are ascribed, you know, very negative cultural characteristics, right? And that's, and they're judged in that way, not, you know, in Europe, they're judged as kind of Europe's Mexicans, right? In Russia, mm. they're judged as kind of like backcountry hillbillies. Sure. You know? And it's, and, and, and 
and so even some of the even the few Ukrainians that have gone to Russia, mostly those from the occupied territories, had no choice. Were basically given a Russian passport and said, "You're Russian now." Mm. They keep their Ukrainian passports. Most of them actually go to the EU eventually. Sure. Um, uh, those that have stayed um, in Russia are are not doing very well. If you look, there's there's a little bit about this that's starting to come out now. And um, so a lot of those, even a lot of those Ukrainians who were um, who were basically from the occupied territories are now coming back to Ukraine and going to the EU um, that have for years. So a lot of those, both both those 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 that minority and the vast those seven million people that went to um, uh, outside initially went outside to to uh, outside of Ukraine to Europe um, have come back. Um, many of them within six months, um, but certainly that is the case. You know, a few years down the road, the folks that have stayed have tend to have more resources and, and were able to settle in Europe. Um, people who have not been as as often goes for these conflict for for conflicts of and these displacements, um, people who are uh, people who are Work, working class people, right? right, who are who actually are bear the brunt of of this war, and I don't have the resource to um, to stay in light of the lack of social support, right? Are the ones who come back? Um, they are often um, there. There are there is actually some substantial support that um, in Ukraine that has been organized, self often self organized, um, uh, uh, to to help people who are returning. Um, and there's a lot of those are professional organizations and NGOs that um, have been, you know, are often have been working internationally for a long time, um, UN agencies, et cetera. But a lot of them are just kind of often self-organized um, and, um, and a lot of them are struggling, but a lot of them also- Like have, mutual aid kind of things you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting to study. So there's a couple of folks um, who are looking at how kind of mutual aid various mutual aid projects are developing both around the war and for and around displaced people um, who are often the ones who are most the ones who come back are also most to be most likely to be uh, patriotic right and are, are actually mm. back and and be involved in the war effort you know there's a lot of stuff in the news we hear these days oh Ukrainians are demoralized you know like a lot of people are still volunteering mm. for and even coming back to the country to to volunteer and fight against the occupier, right? So um, don't believe all you hear basically. And, and the bigger story is, the bigger story is here, you know, despite, you know, various moods and people are pretty disappointed about recent changes. The, you know, the, the guy that basically the army, the army general Zaluzny, right? He was, he was actually, uh, he, he was taken off the as the as the head of the armed forces a couple of months ago, right? Right. Well, most people are pretty upset about that, right? Mm. They're kind of in terms, but overall, people are steadfast in their um, in their support. They understand this is an existential crisis for Ukrainians as a war of independence, um, and and they are and and most people know this despite you know obvious uh, you know personal struggles are like they're donating every penny mm. to make sure that um and 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 like you know making sure that um their friends and families uh kids have coats when they're right. going to the front, right so i encourage you guys to support various socialist internationalist projects um of uh you know of I can, I'm happy to share with you, right? Sure. Well, yeah, are, I was gonna, I was gonna say, you know, the the, and from the right that are fighting for Ukraine for, for Ukrainian independence against Russian occupation, and I encourage you guys to support leftist projects. That um, a lot of those on the right tend to uh, tend to have kind of fettered out. They've not been institutionalized in the state, as you often hear from mm. uh, from the states, but they do have some some organizational support uh, power, um, and and so leftists who are fighting for Ukraine need a lot of support and they need a lot of support from within Ukraine. So instead of often as we hear kind of marginalizing Ukrainians as kind of like, you know, being the two, as we often hear misunderstood, right? As puppets of the US, let's actually look at their struggle of what it is on their right. on its own terms and look at the leftist groups that are actually fighting on the ground and support them. Right. Um, encourage your readers to consider um, not just what people are, you know, people who have fled are doing, but also um, people have come back, all right, and people have stayed, and what they're doing to, and what we can, in international solidarity, support Ukrainians that are on against occupation. Because if we support, if we can get folks, I think strategically as socialists, right? If we can, 
if we show the world, right, that we are morally consistent, right, in mm. supporting Palestine, supporting Ukraine, right, against very different forms of, very different forms of occupation, right. extremely different, right? Um, but there are still different forms of occupation. We can actually achieve international solidarity across those groups um, and, and across different oppressed groups in emerging conflicts around the world as well. So again, people have left. It's important. It's kind of what I study, but people have come back um, is an emerging field of interest for me. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, just as Palestinians, you know, have for generations sought to return, right, sought return, Ukrainians also seek to return home, you know, um, to Donetsk, right, to, right. Uh, to Luhansk, right, to those regions, Donbass, that have, you know, I've traveled to when I was a kid, I've visited a lot of them in my last 10 years before they were occupied, right? The, all those things are not going to go away, just mm. because, you know, some 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 Donald Trump is going to decide he doesn't want to send weapons to Ukraine. People are going to keep fighting. They're going to keep fighting to the last. Um, they're going to be. They're going to keep fighting until 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 there's until they can actually re, re, reclaim and and re, and and go back to their land. Um, uh, and this goes. So I, so I want to remind you all that um, today in that uh, you know we haven't been in a war for two years. Right. Uh, there's the long war is actually started about 10 years ago in Russia first the next Crimea. Um, and so in, in this in this time, you know, there's a lot of media you see out there about, well, the war has been going on for 10 years. Um, yes, the war has gone on for 10 years. Um, and uh, but to, to 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 consider how it has gone 10 years, how it has come to this. Right. We need to understand um the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, right? Not just as it's kind of like, you know, one country in the Soviet Union, but it has a lot of, there's a lot of internal dynamics to the region that where, where Ukraine has been historically kind of colonized and marginalized in that uh, both, both territorially by, by the Russian empire before the Soviet Union, right? And, um, and during Soviet times as well. Um, as, as we, so if we, as socialists, we're, we're serious about understanding, um, understanding as internationalists, right? We need to understand that history. Um, so I'm happy to, you know, I think the later questions. Maybe well, yeah, I mean, that was what, yeah, that, yeah. that was kind of where I was going to go. Yeah, please. I was just going to say, you know, I mean, the, you know, yeah, I, the, you know, Ukrainian people don't just do whatever the U.S. says. Um, right. But also, I mean, I think we know the U.S. motives are not pure by any means, right? Like the U.S. is is not a you know a benevolent you know friendly uh, whatever. They have their own interests uh, in Ukraine, and working people in Ukraine are going to be in the middle of right. all of that, both on the Russian side. But if there's some form of end to this, that then the U.S. is going to try to find ways to um, be in a dominant position. Ukraine and the left is going to have to organize against that as well. Um, you know, because they want to maintain control of their own uh, lives. Um, but like, you know, I just, yeah, do you, I wanted to um, find out a little bit more. Are there, you know, cause we're seeing this from the U S are there things that you want people in the U S to, you've talked about it a little bit to understand about the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, both, you know, currently during uh, uh, with this ongoing um, uh, Russian occupation, as well as, you know, historically, uh, the situation between Russia and Ukraine, and are there any books or movies or news sources that you recommend folks um, uh, check out that you know, off the top of your head, uh, uh, yep. give give some good information on that uh, on that piece? Sure. Well, first of all, um, obviously the U.S. doesn't have <laughs> uh, 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 you know its good intentions. That does not mean, however, that we should fight against international solidarity with. Ukraine against Russian occupation. Um, just like we fought, you know, for a socialist, for the independent uh Rahava, right? In and and actually in and 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 support Kurdistan Kurdistan. We should support oppressed people and against their fight in against occupation um in various regional conflicts. Um the we don't live in this um tanky multipolar world that everybody seems to cry about on the Stalinist end, right? We live in, we live, we want a non-polar world. We want a world, in order to get to a multipolar world, we must support people who are fighting against oppression and colonization. 
But to do that, we need to take seriously the role of also of the US, United States. Um, to, to think, to, to, to look at that more carefully, um, I encourage you guys to check out and to think about the political economy of um, not just the United States as a government, but the various transnational economic interests, right, that often determine and often more recently not tend not to determine um, US and EU policy. Right. Uh, uh, I would like you guys to turn your attention to the British economist, Simon Pirani, um, P-I-R-A-N-I. Um, he has studied Ukraine and energy politics in Russia and Ukraine for decades. Um, his most recent, uh, the Ukrainian website, Spilne, the Commons, commons.com.ua um, has a wonderful interview with him from uh, just less than a year ago. Um, and I encourage you guys to read it. So thinking uh, in, in it, he highlights how Russian elites um, in oil and gas elites are often aligned with transnational business interests in the US. So it is often in the interest. So, so the reason we see so much resistance to um, Ukrainian, to supporting, to support, it, it, I think the reason I think we have, we see so much resistance to supporting Ukraine in the last, from the, from the right is because of some of these business interests. Um, and, and so we, and, and, and the reasons for that are very, you know, I don't want to explain here, sure. but the energy and gas politics are such in, across Europe and that involve U.S. interests as well to a degree, are in, in such that business interests want to make sure that Russia, right, actually main, Russian elites maintain control over, um, maintain economic and political control over Ukraine. That is why there are, there, there's, there's an, there, yes, there is an, part of kind of an in state interstate kind of conflict. But the broader political economic currents that are under undergrading the war today should be understood in, in, in terms of how, you know, the restrictions on oil prices and the prices of Western companies in the Russian energy market, which are which are historic, which are which 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 go back long before the war. And we need to understand how that um, how those foreign investments have worked in Russia that involve a lot of US interests from Exxon and on um, to, to, to understand what is hap to understand how, um, uh, how and why, uh, you know, U US has, or maybe has not supported mm -hmm. Ukraine. In fact, the lip, the, the extent to which, uh, the extent to which and the kinds of, of armed support the, the US has sold as, 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 as given Ukraine are actually quite minimal. If you would consider the, the what has been requested and what has been what is actually needed to make sure to to withstand um, Russian assault right in, in in the early days of the war, it has dragged its feet for years and still does. So in the, so in, in in thinking about the political economy, but we should we should look at what's happening on the ground with uh, transnational um, transnational um, financial institutions on one hand, but also. Um, the Western companies in the Russian energy market and what their interests are and what their connections to interlocks are with, with, with American politicians. It's not as simple as an inter-imperialist conflict um, as, some, as, as some folks on the tanky side of, of socialist politics in Western world like you think. We need to listen to Ukrainian socialists and a lot of people who have studied this for a long time um, to, to think about um, uh, to, under to really understand what's happening. Um, in that sense, to, to get to your second question about um, uh, uh, things to read. Current analysis, again, I wanna draw your attention to, it's a kind of a pop academic, but very accessible website on analysis. It's not for news, um, uh, the commons. It's run just out so of you know, or you keep talking, but uh, we are going to run out of time in a second. But I can just send you another link right after, and we can hop back sure. on for like five or ten a couple hours. of books in addition to the commons. Um, Sergei Plochy's uh, The Russo Ukrainian War, The Return of History. Hold it in front it. of your face because your blurred background is blurring it out. I don't know okay, if that'll work, maybe not. There, yeah. it's getting so I'm gonna so, so, <laughs> we'll, so, we'll, we'll post the link, sure. Yeah, so this is a wonderful book on the long history of Ukraine and Russia. And how, um, uh, from from a historian, from a top Ukrainian historian, no, globally renowned. Um, if you want to try to clarify what is what happened in the Ukrainian revolu revolution of dignity in 2014, there's this book called "Without the State: Self Organization and Political Activism in Ukraine." It's been it just released over the last year by um, by Emily Chanel Justice. She's a Canadian uh, Canadian. Uh, so this book, um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about it. I guess. Yeah. I guess 
blurred screen. You can't quite tell. Oh, it was in the middle for a second. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. It's got this, you know, the, 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 the main square in Kiev, uh, the, uh, the Maidan, that it means square, uh, literally. And so it, that, it, that, was, uh, that was occupied by protesters 2014, led to the revolution of dignity after, um, after uh, the failed EU trade agreement that was opposed by the pro-Russian president then pro-Russian president of Ukraine. Um, it's about the actual event and the various, and then the left and the role of the organized left and the new left in participating in the Euromaidan protest, which is very, which is very misunderstood, I think, in the West, especially in the Western left. Um, and it's called "Without the State: Self-Organization Political Activism in Ukraine." It's by Emily Chanel Justice. Um, I encourage you guys to check it out. It just came out in the last year. Um, it's on University of Toronto Press. Um, if you want, if any of you guys are really reading it, um, she uh, check her out. She, I think she's at. Um, um, she's at the Harvard Ukrainian Institute right now visiting for a year. Um, and she, uh, and uh, I think she's, she's off, to, she's in maybe in Finland right now for a year for a fellowship there. Uh, but she is, I'm happy to introduce you guys. If anybody wants to do a book club and read that book, I, I would be really interested in doing that. I've read it once myself. Um, there are a lot of people who mentioned in that book who are, who are fighting for Ukraine and leftist battalions. Um, and 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 in the territorial defense forces, which is kind of the the newly assembled um, newly assembled arm of the of the Ukrainian army from the ground up during the invasion, um, and so a lot of those folks who are uh, affiliated with socialist organizations and anarchist organizations in Ukraine are um, are are prominently featured in this book, um, and so we're and, and so there are, so so we need to understand also not just um, the the ways in which um, uh, and the ways in which kind of Russian and U.S. politics plays it, but how Ukrainians from the ground up, what they want, right? right? And how and how they come and how this is just about a fight for dignity, right? The revolution of dignity was mostly about self-organization against, um, you know, a, a, a capitalist economy that was benefiting oligarchs. That's really right. all it was. People who just wanted to live a quality of life without, um, w without, uh, in, in, in where. It, not in a system that is that is that is ruled by oligarchs, right? And uh, where where wealth is very evenly distributed, such as in Russia, which has if you read Simon Piketty, right? You know, was, right, right. Uh, if you read Piketty, you can you see a lot of you see that Russia has some of the worst inequality in the world, and and it continues to do so. Ukrainians did not want to live in that way um, anymore, as and and there and the ways in which Ukraine had been tied to Russia for. Um, for even in the decades following its independence, they wanted to cut it off. They wanted to have a trade agreement with the EU, which would not have been the best, but it would not have been the FTA either, right? It was actually a pretty solid um, agreement that had some social rights involved, even as you, Ukraine was not continues not to be a part of the EU. This continues, the long struggle continues there as well. So we need to support Ukrainians and understand what the event was about and the role of the left. So I encourage you guys to check out that book. Um, but the book by Sergei Plohi would be um, would be my choice for anybody who wants to broad overview of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and how we've come to this place um, with the with with Russia's full scale invasion in 2022, um, and from a historical perspective that goes back centuries, um, and and but mostly in the 20th century. He's a he's a 20th century historian, nuclear historian. Um, so you studied the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, and this is his new book on the region um, in the aftermath of the war. Um, it's on, again, Sergei Plohi, P-L-O-K-H-Y, um, and uh, I'll, I'll send that over as well. That would be great. Well, I really appreciate you uh, speaking with me. Is there, you know, is there anything else that you want to say before you go or, 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 or uh, share or recommend or plug before you go? Yeah, I'd like to, you know, remind you, remind everybody of, you know, the the Commons website, the the that I that I'll send along as well, and to keep to keep a keep an eye out for current analysis there, and to follow Ukrainian Ukrainians who are not just Russians who are imprisoned and 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 facing, uh, you know, state repression, but to follow Ukrainians who are prisoners of war, support Ukrainian socialists who are fighting, um, in for for against occupation. Um, and even though, even as we are 
uh, even even in, in solidarity with right people all over the world that are finding occupation and 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 uh, and and I think that the two struggles of Palestinian resistance to uh, to to is to Israel's occupation on one hand and Ukrainians occupation a resistance to Russia's occupation are very different, but they have a lot of alliance. There's a lot of alliances to be built there, where uh, against the geopolitics that we see uh, ruling the day, um, is that would I think build up um, build up a more uh, a more ethical and just and practical socialist alliance across um, that that is understanding of the international uh, international economic interests of of, of oligarchs around the world and of elites that seek to um, seek to make sure that people are divided, right? And we need to make sure that people are united um, and understand how these movements are interconnected. So I encourage you guys to re inform yourself a little bit more. Follow um, uh, follow follow the Commons um, Commons uh, uh, the, the the official website. There is is uh, I'll send it along. Right. Commons.com.ua. Um, Commons.com.ua. Yeah. 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 Slash EN if you need English. Slash EN for the English version. Yeah. Well, I, right. I really appreciate your time. I'm glad we were able to finally connect and uh, you have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much, Nick. Take care. Bye. Take care.